Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Welcome to the Delling Pool podcast. And after the exciting adventure we had two weeks ago, where we had a youth, we had an 18 year old Old Etonian, a, a sixth form scholar who was really popular, by the way, Baz. He was. Um, uh, he went down really well. He, it was actually, the, according to I, iTunes, it was the third most popular podcast, which totally amazed me. But it shows there's an appetite there, there for people to listen to interesting, interesting kids. So I found another interesting kid. Um, his name is Stephen Edgington, and he's what little I've seen of him on the internet he's done some pretty amazing thing he's, he's, he's one of those self-starters I think you'd, uh, they yes. call them in the fashionable parlance and he's already been out there he's got a job he's been doing work experience with Ian Dale at LBC he's went and made friends with Isabel Oakeshott who's been taking him, him under her wing and yesterday Stephen you went to number 10 to see the Prime Minister, is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So Ian Dale, who I'm shadowing for the week, um, interviewed Theresa May in number 10, and I was lucky enough to tag along to that. Um, I was there whilst they were doing the interview, and I was sort of on the sidelines, but still, it was an amazing experience and yeah, really exciting. Can I ask you, are, are you a, a fan of the, of the Prime Minister? Uh, yes, I am. Um, it might not be a very sexy thing to say, but yes, I mean, these days, yes, I am. I think she's done, I mean, obviously the election campaign didn't go well, but her first 10 months um, was brilliant, I think, and I think she did a great job. But obviously, more recently, you can say in hindsight, you, I don't think you should judge her for the last month. I think you should judge her for what, you know, the substance. Um, but yeah, I think she's done I think she's done a good job under the circumstances and she's really come out fighting after the general election. So yeah, I do admire Theresa May um, and I'm a fan of her, yeah. That's very generous of you. Um, I, I, okay, well, I, I, I'm gonna put that down to youthful naivety and, and, you and experience. I'm fascinated to know a bit more about how you became a conservative. Because tell me, wh- wh- what school are you at or were you at? I'm at a state sixth form college um, in Chichester uh, called Bishop Luffer. I'm still there. I'm in year 12, moving on to year 13 next year. And um, yeah, I'm at state school. Right. And are you the only conservative in the village? Uh, no, actually. No, I'll surprise you. I was in my old school, um, w- which was in Portsmouth, which is sort of a different Tell demographic. Tell me about that first. I want to hear about the, about being, okay. being a, the only conservative okay. in the school. Because Portsmouth's pretty rough. Yes, yes. Well, I, luckily, I lived in sort of the nicer area, which, I mean, every city has a slightly nicer area, but even Portsmouth. Um, but yes. I don't believe that. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, the, the posh bit of Portsmouth. Well, I wasn't really on Portsmouth. It was just sort of in the north bit. Anyway. Yes, uh, being the only Conservative in the in the village was extremely fun, and I'll tell you why. Because you could walk into a classroom and you would have 29 kids who essentially have been brainwashed into believing these socially and economically liberal ideas that the teachers feed them. Um, a good example is my uh, religious studies teacher once said that UKIP were like the Nazis and it was my job to say no that's that's total bollocks and I could put my hand up and I could say miss you're talking absolute crap or I wouldn't say it like that um, and I'd debate her and everyone would love it and you you'd sort of become an interesting character and people would like to come up to you and say well done you just because it's almost like rebelling against the teachers and people really like that and um, yeah so it's really interesting experience being the only conservative although there was some downsides obviously you don't get, you don't make many friends. Um, well, well, you do, but you lose a few friends because you know people just find you so abhorrent. For example, the Brexit vote um, last year, big. I was a big Leave campaigner, and on the day of the vote, I got a message saying that they should, uh, from people that I know, um, that I should be beaten up um, because apparently I caused um, Nando's to shut down, which was a sort of fake news. Apparently, that you? apparently that was me, um, because there was sort of a, a story on the Lad Bible that said um, Nando's was going to close because of Brexit, which is obviously total crap. Um, but apparently that was my fault. Um, yeah, I got I got threats. I got people, me- you know, people messaging me really nasty stuff. Um, What's the Lad Bible, by the way? The Lad Bible is sort of an internet uh, Facebook. Uh, n- 
potential news organisation, I wouldn't really call it news, um, it sort of does clickbait stories for teenagers. Um, oh, right. So it's got millions and millions of views. And, and presumably and it's, it's completely left. Yes, well, they tr they pretend to be neutral, but yes, it's just, I mean, it's like the independent, yeah, totally. Okay, definitely. so I'm, I'm very interested. So you went to a, a, a rough-ish comprehensive. Yeah. And what you found, to my surprise anyway, is that actually being a conservative was kind of a badge of honour because you were the rebel. Yes, exactly. And I don't think, and the thing is, when you're in secondary school, people don't have really strong political opinions. They're not fully formed and, um, you, you know, you can persuade people. But as you get a little bit older and you get a little bit wiser, I think people have more you know confirmed strong beliefs and things so secondary school is a bit easier uh it's sort of more easy ride because people don't have those sort of set opinions just yet they're just sort of beginning to form opinions because recently there was a, a story in the papers about some celebrity teacher saying that pretty much all state schools are madrasas for the left and he was he was lamenting the fact that teachers swing so so nakedly left these days and that they do brainwash their their charges do you think that th there's some truth in that oh it's a hundred percent true it, i mean i've been to two schools so my current school my old school and in both the teachers are vehemently left-wing especially in the one in portsmouth um they would come out with ridiculous statements with supporting labor or going against the conservatives saying you know evil cuts etc etc the, the usual cliche nonsense and they wouldn't say it was their opinion it would be fact and that was a, that was the problem they would never say it was their opinion they would just say it was fact and people i felt that people started to believe them and I think from that early age, you get those that political indoctrination in the schools. And I, it's actually illegal for teachers to be political in the classroom. Is it? Yes, it's totally illegal. But no one gives a shit because the government doesn't care. Why would they? It's not an issue on that's, that's on the mainstream agenda. And it's just it's an issue that I, I really am passionate about. And I think it needs to be solved because it's totally wrong. Why should we be, you know, educated in these classrooms, you know, vulnerable young people who get the, basically exposed to these left-wing views at a really early age. No wonder why Jeremy Corbyn got so much of the young vote. Yeah, well, we, we, we can talk more about that in a moment. Yeah. So are we talking... What classes are we talking in? So it wouldn't be the sciences or the maths. It would be the humani humanities, so the history, the geography, the religious studies, because that's the more political subjects just generally. Um, I don't. You can't do politics at GCSE, I don't think. So... Um, Basically, any subject that involves some kind of political discussion, discussion, um, there would be a left-wing view, a left-wing view of a teacher. And I would urge people listening to this podcast if they are still in school, because I know some people do listen to this podcast who are quite young. Um, just challenge your teachers. Just tell them off if they're saying an opinion. Don't be uh, scared to put your hand up and say no. Actually, you're wrong. This is this is the actual. You know, this is what I think, and that's not that's not fact. It's an opinion. And how? How bright were the teachers? Did did, did 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 you get the impression that these were people who ought to be <laughs> ought to be teaching teaching children? Uh, no, I think I I'm not. I don't think they were stupid. I think I actually really admired them. I just think it's totally wrong um, of them to expose their political opinions in the classroom. Okay, so in t in terms of their actual ability to teach, say an English teacher, they knew their grammar, and the history teacher did actually know that Hitler wasn't. Russian and that yes, kind of no, thing. I think, that, I mean, on my history teacher, really, really left-wing, I think he was a member of the Labour Party, um, but a brilliant teacher. Right. I mean, I got an A-star in history because of him. He was absolutely excellent. Again, my media studies teacher, very, very left-wing, Green Party activist, um, but an excellent teacher. So I don't think, I'm not going to attack them personally just because of their political beliefs. I just think what they what they shouldn't be saying their political beliefs. In the You've got in the a GCSE in media studies. I do, which your is, career I mean, is, your career is <laughs> toast, mate. You realise that, that people people who study media studies at university apparently earn less than people who haven't been to university. I think, I think you've got to make the comparison, though, isn't it? It's GCSEs versus um, yeah. university. I'm not I'm, I'm not put doing my life degree on uh, media studies. I'd sort of be an interesting thing to do when I was, you know, in secondary school. So. But <laughs> how did you how did you come to be a conservative? Given you, you were the only, and is it like being gay? Is it something you just wake up with one day and you discover no, that you I are? I don't think so. I think it's it's always a journey, isn't it, to find your political beliefs? And I'm not. I don't agree with the conservatives on everything. Like I'm very. I'm quite socially liberal. I think most young people are because they're exposed to that sort of again you're exposed to them oh, socially but, liberal. but who says the conservatives aren't socially liberal well no, no no but um there's they're sort of a stereotype that they're not yeah um, yeah, yeah sure. and i think that throughout the political i mean 
the last two years have just been amazing politically for um, you know the referendum, the Scottish referendum, the general election. I think it's really engaging young people. And I was just exposed to I think mostly the internet. It's just you know you go on YouTube and you watch these clips of other people debating, and you get fascinated in it. And eventually you just think who do I agree with? Do I agree with Farage or do I agree with Nick Clegg? And I think I, in the end I went with Farage because I just thought, you know, he was much more passionate and I really believed in what he was saying. So when did this happen to you? How old were you? I think I was about 14. Um, so that's three years you ago. freak. I know, it's weird, isn't it? You're 18 now? I'm 17. You're 17 now. My, oh, so you are officially I, the youngest yes. person we've had on the podcast. Yes, I'm going to take that mantle. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's, that, that's good. So, so you kind of, are your parents conservative? Um, no, my mum is socialist and my dad's sort of a floating voter. But yeah. So lots of mum baiting opportunities then at breakfast. God, no, I'd rather not. <laughs> I try and avoid politics with my family. To do be you? Honest. Yeah, well, I try. So what, what, what paper do they read or don't they? Well, it's interesting. I think my mum does actually read The Guardian sometimes, but um, no, I don't think generally we don't read newspapers because, you know, the internet's just so dominant these days. Right, yes. Well, it, it is for your generation. I think we sort of legacy legacy people. We we, we take a newspaper out of out of habit because I, I still read a paper because it's what one does at breakfast. But I think my family's quite... Um, sort of tight for their money I don't want to be sound harsh so I don't think like buy you could just get it online for free basically and that's our that's our view of it but yeah right and so you not only became interested in conservatism but you took it upon yourself to do like internet stuff like you've got your own um YouTube page have yeah you that's right channel? so my YouTube channel Politics UK you can search on YouTube now um, How, well, I'm, I'm surprised that one hadn't been snagged yeah that's what everyone says Politics I, UK I, I think on YouTube you're, you could sort of anyone can allow allowed to use any name but um, oh, I, see. That, I was sort of the first one I mean there are a few others that had zero subscribers kind of thing but um, yeah no I took it just because it was a generic you know every, memorable name anyway a few years ago I really liked uh, Prime Minister's Questions and watching that with David Cameron and I thought you know as a kid I thought it was fascinating watching these two people debate and I, I re actually re-uploaded um, the bit where David Cameron and Ed Miliband would debate but I cut out all the other crap with the other MPs and my first video got 120,000 views and from then on I just started uploading a few more Prime Minister's Questions and then I got into sort of doing um, political montages and uh, edit uh, developing my editing skills um, and they, they were getting you know tens of thousands of views 20,000 views I was like really excited and then um, last November I started doing political interviews um, with people like you journalists and politicians um, and since November I've done seven um, I've actually been to Brussels and I've done a couple with a few a couple of MEPs and that's how I met Isabel Oakeshaw who we talked about earlier and yeah that's basically how the channel's grown it's got three million views um, yeah it's really really that fun. I don't have much of a handle on on whether that's good or bad. I mean, obviously, it's not shit. Is 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 it good? I think it's good. Um, the, in terms of views, three million views is a lot of views. I mean, that takes you know, it took me almost a year and a half to get that amount of views, and I think not not everyone gets that. And I think no, it is good. Um, yeah, I'll bet Taylor Swift gets more views than that. I bet a new Taylor Swift. Well, she video. has a different market, doesn't she? I mean, <laughs> yeah, slightly more popular. Yeah. yeah. All right. And are you? Can you monetize it? Yes, and I am monetizing it. Are you? Yes. Well, how much are you making out of it? Go on, it tell varies. Me. Um, let's set. I'll put it at a few hundred pounds a month. Um, so you're an entrepreneur as well. Well, I wouldn't say That's that. That's great. <laughs> no, but that is. It makes me so happy. And you, the listener, because we only have one listener, and he's our special. He, he or she or Z is our special friend um, <laughs> they're going to be very happy to hear this they're going to be happy to hear you yeah. because you're, you're doing you're going out there you don't think the world owes you a living no and um, I, I mean everything that I've done in terms of YouTube is all been done by myself I haven't had any help from contacts I haven't had any help from my family I've just gone out there I've emailed politicians I've emailed journalists and, I, and I've put my views out there and I've just put it online and pe if people like it then they watch it and they share it and they like it and that actually earns me money which is a good thing but I don't do it for the money I do it because I really enjoy it and I think what I would say to people listening is just go out and there's no, there's no problem in just doing something yourself anyone can do it the internet's totally free and if you've got the passion then you should just go for it which I can I can second if 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 my listener is young and listening to this there is a lesson to be learned here which is that actually 
just go out there and do what you want to do because well as Stephen shows me why am I talking to him now it's because when I was talking to Isabel she said I've met this amazing kid that's how that's how you get get jobs that's how you how you exactly. get that's how you end up doing what you want to do in life rather than what life forces on you because you couldn't find what you wanted to do just go out and grab it yeah. yeah and you don't need you don't need contacts to start off with you make your own contacts you don't need loads of money you don't need loads of connections you don't need to go to Eton um, like although it helps <laughs> it does, probably I mean, it probably does help but I've done it without you yeah know, exactly you don't need to go to yeah. private schools to do well and I think they're becoming less and less relevant by the second because I mean Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn none of them went to um, Eton or um, I don't think you, Jeremy Corbyn Jeremy Corbyn's quite to posh isn't he I mean he grew up in a rectory with seven, seven bedrooms I mean he got two E's at A level and he didn't go to university so well I mean I mean, relatively for a Labour Party leader he is probably pretty posh yes <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly but anyway yes we, we, we agree you don't have to be to be posh to succeed and, and I'm sure yeah. that's that's jolly good what do you want to do? That's a really difficult question. I'm really enjoying the YouTube channel, so I really love doing interviews. And um, so I think the political journalism side is really interesting and something that I might want to go into. But I'm young, I've got a lot of time ahead of me, so I don't really know exactly what I want to do. Cool. Yeah, so yeah. Well, what I, I would say to you is um, don't expect a job in, in conventional media because I don't think it will exist no. by the time you're of a of a sort of post-university age. I mean, it's collapsing, it's dying on its feet. Definitely. You're probably much better off doing your own thing and, 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 and monetizing it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, YouTube channels, they tend to start off sort of grow slowly and then exponentially um, get really big. So there are some YouTubers, you know, who have hundreds of thousands of subscribers, millions of views, um, millions of subscribers even, and they earn a living off it. Um, they, they do it as a full-time job. And there's a big market out there for you know, for political journalism on YouTube and on other new sort of forms of social media. So you can do it and as a job. I wanted to ask you a question, uh, and it relates to something I was talking about with, with Baz, Sebastian Shemirani, in, the, in that podcast, yep. um, two, two podcasts ago, w which is, given that we on the right are so much better at memes than the left, why aren't we winning? Why aren't we winning in what sense? Well, I mean, why are all the kids voting for Corbyn? I mean, sh we, we've got, we've got, we've got Keck. We've got, we've got the memes. Why aren't we, why aren't we trouncing the enemy? <laughs> I think it's a really obvious answer to that question, and it's free money. If someone's offering you a twenty-seven k bribe, but you're not going to, you know, pass that down. You don't give a shit when you're young about w what the consequences are for, um, you know, for the treasury, etc. Someone's offering you free money. You take it, and um, yeah, I think. Corbyn just he said to young people look you can have the world and th you know they they ignore how he's going to pay for it because he has no clue how he's going to pay for it and I'm um, even this story about them um, going back on their promise for this cancelling all student debt I don't think that will have any impact on young people whatsoever anyway. do you know what? I, th I agree with you uh, even though Guido is, is bigging it up saying two and a half million views of, of, of Corbyn reneging on his promise I think that the kids are just going to see this as a sign of his integrity. Yes. So he's made his promise. He's suddenly realised that, that he, he can't afford it. So he's, he's being sensible and rational. And, and this shows he's, he's a statesman. And how, he, how they spun it is really clever as well. They've said it's an ambition. And ambition doesn't say we totally, we're totally we not doing it. It says, oh, it might happen in the future, maybe. But you can carry on voting, to us and voting for us. And it's an ambition, so yeah. One of the exciting podcasts I've got coming up, I haven't, I haven't booked him yet, but somebody is going to explain to me how th the techniques that Jeremy Corbyn uses in interviews, for example, why, why couldn't Andrew Neil lay a finger on him when Andrew Neil destroys everyone be yeah. before him? Uh, and, and what's happened to this man who used to be a kind of rather embarrassing bloke in carrying a skateboard or in, in skateboard shorts, looking like a scruff, looking like Wurzel Gummidge, and now looks kind of with his white crisp white shirt and looks and sounds quite plausible well i think his media trainer must be on a lot of money um or you know highly sought after after those as you say with andrew neil and he did very well with um jeremy paxman as well so yeah yeah you're listening to the delling pole podcast with i forgot to mention at the beginning i forgot to mention my name in case you've forgotten it's james delling the delling pole podcast with me James Dellingpole and my very special and the youngest guest Stephen Edgington. More in a moment.
Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Paul in Connecticut, welcome to the show. And I'm tired of, of banging my head against the wall. And every time you turn around, there's somebody else picking your pocket. It's insurance, it's taxes, it's regulations. I'm so sick of it. All they do is they hammer the people that want to get out there and do something every day. And they reward the people that stay home and do nothing. It's, I'm, I'm beyond done with it. I'm, I've had it. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special and youngest guest, Stephen Edgington, who is only 17, and yet he is turning out to be a very promising, eager conservative, red pilling his fellow students at, at rough Portsmouth comprehensive schools <laughs> and now going out into the world getting three million views on his YouTube channel which I think is very impressive and and making a living at well making some money out of it enough to pay for his jacket <laughs> drugs whatever I don't know um, so we were talking in the interval about Jacob Rees-Mogg I imagine you must probably be a fan I'm a huge fan. Um, I met him last night at LBC, actually. And, yeah, I know. <laughs> it was how, how special was that? Yes, I know. It was amazing. And him and... Uh, it's, it's actually him and Farage were both there. And um, the chemistry was just um, ex- so exciting. And you could see them joking and having banter about Twitter. And you, you've got these two dinosaurs of the 40s, it feels like, talking about this such a recent invention. It was, it was fascinating. But no, Jacob Rees-Mogg is a brilliant politician, excellent, excellent um, orator, and I think he would make a good prime minister, not a great prime minister, because he, uh, he doesn't, I don't think he has the experience um, to do the job as well as some people think he might do. Well, like you don't you. have the experience either, no, Stephen, I but you're doing, you're doing cool shit already. Well, I think I experience think is it, overrated. I think there's a difference between interviewing some people on YouTube and being prime minister. Um, and Don't I mean, he's run, he's run a, 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 a an asset management company. Donald Trump had no experience in politics, and, um, and look at him, he's great. And, well, and look at him, he's doing... Stop that. I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I don't want your half-baked views on Donald Trump. We're going, we're going to talk about that in the, okay. in the third section. Okay. But look, you don't know enough. You're wrong. Just accept it. Just accept that there's some things that the kids don't know. Oh, going exactly. back to... Going back to Jacob Rees-Mogg, yep. isn't one of the wonderful things about him? Because I, and I was thinking this. I by accident I listened to I, d- I never listened to my old podcast, but I listened to it just a, a, a teeny segment of my Jacob Rees-Mogg one, and I was reminded one of the really special things about the Jacob is that when you interview him, or before he speaks, you think he's never going to be as outspoken as I'd like him to be, and outspoken as clear and conservative because hey, he's a Tory MP and they never speak the truth. They always, they always virtue signal or, or hedge around the subject. And he opens his mouth and he offers the kind of opinions that you think, yeah, this is gold. I think he's extremely honest and I think he's extremely good at answering tough questions. So I read your article in The Spectator and I think you linked to a YouTube clip of him on Question Time um, uh, when he was talking about whether David Cameron was right to say it was selfish to, you know, in- increase public sector pay. And he handled that so brilliantly. And I think, he, as a politician, he's ap- he's, he must have the intelligence and the integrity to answer questions honestly to voters. And when voters see him, I think they genuinely believe in what he's saying. And even if he says something really controversial, he makes it sound very, very reasonable. Um, and like a normal policy that any politician can, you know, can uphold. So, yeah. Do you think it's because politicians are generally intellectually low grade or do you think it's it's because they're cowardly and career safe that they can't answer a question straight I don't actually know the answer to that because I don't know politicians well enough you know I I can't get in the head of a politician I can only guess and I think that politicians are extremely intelligent actually I think they're really clever people I think some of them aren't 
Some of them are, but I think the majority are, I think they're totally degraded in the press. And I think it's a really, it's a shame because I, I have a lot of respect for politicians. They have to go through a lot from journalists like you. Their whole life gets, you know, turned upside down. Um, but no, I don't think, I don't think they're willfully lying um, a lot of the time. I think, again, there's always a minority that are, but I think the majority of politicians are intelligent, capable people. But there's this whole world of spin out there. And I think there's a lot of pressure on politicians today to not tell the truth and to not be totally honest with voters for fear of being rejected by voters and for fear of not being popular. And I think it's a very much a very much popularity contest these days. Well, but I think it always was. I, yeah. I, I, um, you've reminded me, you've taken me back seeing you. I've, I've remembered that I wasn't totally apolitical when I was when I was your age, but when I was exactly your age, a I was at school and we used to get these guest speakers and a speaker came along and he was the local MP for Worcestershire South or wherever, where, yeah. wherever we were. And I remember by the end of his, his talk spitting with fury at his disingenuousness and, and the, the way he wouldn't really... He answered a few questions, and I, and I hated the way that, that he wasn't being direct. And some people have people have said that I'm slightly on the spectrum in terms of the way I don't have a filter, and I just, you know, I say what I think. Yeah. And I suppose maybe that's one reason why I particularly resent people who can't do that. But um, I, I suppose what I'm saying is that 30 years ago or, or more, when I when, when that happened that was still the case with politicians then and I'm sure it was was before that yeah but y you're right it is that they don't like to be they don't want to be unpopular but I'm saying that that's not really a healthy quality because okay they've got to get elected but at the same time haven't they got to do a job like running the country and stuff it might not be a healthy quality but it's the reality isn't it how how do you get elected without being popular? It's impossible. So that in a way, that it's sort of a catch-22. You've got to be careful about what you say in order to gain votes, in order to get into power. Now, maybe once you're in power, then maybe it should change, and maybe politicians should be much more honest with voters. I mean, a good example of this is the pension age recently got, um, ex I think it got cut back for a few people, uh, uh, millions of people. Right, um, yes. It got reduced by a year. And why wasn't that in the Tory manifesto? Obviously, it was because it's such an unpopular policy. They wouldn't, didn't want to release it. I mean, the, the Home Office probably have been thinking about this for months, um, this policy. It doesn't, it doesn't just come out of thin air. But it's a really good example of politicians using an unpopular policy at once they're in power because they know that they're going to be in power for the next few years and it, it will basically die out, uh, that, the unpopular story. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. Um, uh, sorry, I got completely distracted there. Um, fuck. Um, I was going to ask you something else. I'm sure that I'm sure that Vince can edit this bit out. But normally these things go out completely unedited. Okay. Um, but um, but I, I was just drifting off. I was. <laughs> do you know what I was thinking about actually? I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that that legal meeting, and I was feeling rather guilty that I that I didn't do my job. Oh <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Anyway, no, that, <laughs> that's fine. Um, what were we talking about? We were, we were talking about Jacob Rees-Mogg, and then we were talking oh about... Oh, yeah, then we got, got, got sidetracked, yeah. Discussed. So, it's interesting, isn't it, that that Jacob Rees-Mogg um, is not embarrassed to be seen with the Nige, with Farage. Because I think a lot of Tory MPs are, they feel sort of that, that, like they oughtn't to have anything to do with... Well, maybe they should call him Teflon Mogg, because nothing really sticks to him, it seems. I think he can be associated with uh, people like Nigel... And it just slides off him. People don't care. And maybe that's because he's got a totally different personality. People see him as more honest. And I think, so, I think he's just totally an outcast to most Tory MPs because he can do controversial things. I mean, it's not really that controversial being going on a platform, from, platform with Nigel Farage to the voters. But it might be really controversial for those Tory MPs who just see him as some kind of disgusting outsider. You make a very good distinction there. And I think, is it not the case that too many MPs are concerned about what the BBC will say or, or think and not concerned enough with what the public at large think. And I, I, I'll give you a, a, the best example ever of this. Brexit. The, the, the political and media class were completely out of touch with where the country was. 
I think you're right that, that politicians do worry, or MPs do worry about uh, what the BBC and the mainstream media say. But at the same time, a lot of them, like I mean, there was a huge, sizable chunk of Tory MPs who did come out for Brexit and did go against the grain of the BBC and the liberal, you know, the liberal left. Thinking. Yes, but they didn't think they were going to win. Those Tory, I, I don't think, any, I don't think anyone campaigning for Brexit thought it was going to happen, did they? Well, maybe Farage. I think, I think some people who've been campaigning it for de- for decades, maybe. But for people like Boris, who had recent converts, maybe you're right. Yeah. Um, I do envy you having so early in your political development the experience having had the experience of waking up on june the 24th and discovering that that we'd won i know oh well, i don't know about waking up i think i stayed up all night how oh, did you yeah, oh, I, right, yes. I was down in the counting center in my local in Were portsmouth you? um oh, tell me about it what was fascinating it? i mean you go i was sort of on a fake id because i didn't i wasn't actually allowed in and they just sort of gave me a gave me someone else's name and you know i was I was allowed in and I went around helping the Vote Leave campaign shore up whether they'd won in Portsmouth or not. Because obviously on the BBC when they announce the results, they get early indications of where the vote's going. And how and how that actually happens is you get people from both campaigns in the counting centre looking at the piles of votes in both sides, so the Leave and the Remain votes, and then going to each ward or each district and writing down a bit of paper how many votes you can count and how many votes you see for Leave or Remain and then go back to coordinator they send it off to journalists and that was actually my job which I thought I mean it sounds boring but it was really interesting seeing how many leave votes were coming in because Portsmouth really voted to leave uh, quite heavily and it, I was really proud because I'd been campaigning in Portsmouth for months before and I thought this is something that I've actually genuinely contributed t- towards this Brexit thing and you know waking up or you know being there on June the 24th was an absolutely ecstatic moment for, for a lot of people and including me so yeah. and and so um what happened when 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 was the moment when you realized that that well the portsmouth first of all was going to go your way well there was a brilliant moment where i saw a lib dem um councillor i like this this already yes exactly (laughs) he was sitting um on some stairs in a stairwell and he looked extremely upset and i'd actually met him before because he did a talk at my school and i went over to him are you all right what's wrong and i knew that portsmouth had voted to leave and he looked at me and he just went fuck off (laughs) And I just, it was just a brilliant moment where he was almost in tears on his MacBook and I just felt so ecstatic and so happy that he was so upset. It sounds really bad now, but it was such a brilliant moment. I think he did rather deserve it by his, his, his intemperate response to one, an innocent question from, from a polite <laughs> young man. So did you all go and get pissed afterwards or, or was it... No, uh, I was way too tired. I just, because I've been sp- spent months doing my GCSEs and campaigning. I just felt like, look, I've, I've got to go and have some sleep. So, um, yeah, I didn't go and get pissed. So when you were pounding the streets campaigning for, for Brexit, what were, the, what were people saying to you? Well, it's interesting. Portsmouth voted to leave by about 55% to 45%. So there were a lot of Remainers. And a lot of people were coming up to me and saying, you know, you're a racist, or et cetera, et cetera. And I think this was really spouted by the BBC and the mainstream media a lot, this, the, the, the idea that Brexiteers are racist or whatever. So there's a lot of incidents where I think I learned a lot about being confident and coming up, going up to people where you've got a big old shirt saying, vote, leave, take control. You know, people come up to you calling you a liar, screaming at you. And it's, it was really, and I didn't find that intimidating. I just found it really interesting to be able to talk to people and see how indoctrinate people indoctrinated people are towards their opinion and how they can't some people just can't budge at all they don't take any leeway in any direction but no it was really fun also talking to people who agreed with you because um you'd have some really interesting conversations with people who come up saying you know you're doing a brilliant job well done it was really gratifying seeing that as well so you got both sides uh, well the people who were coming up to you and telling you you were a racist was there any um how did they break down by by age and class and and sex it's interesting. I think generally they were sort of older, lonely men, uh, white men. Um, you would have thought they, those were... So Brexiteers. sad old fucks, I mean, yeah, basically. Yeah, I think <laughs> mainly just sad people. I mean, Portsmouth, it's full of... It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of middle class, or not middle class, lower sort of lower working class um, white men who you know work on the building site. You would have thought they're brilliant vote leave supporters, but yes. a lot of them weren't. A lot of them oh, were really? which is really interesting um, because I think in where I was campaigning in Portsmouth South, there's a really strong Remain campaign there. Um, and but in Portsmouth North, um, where I lived, 
that was a much stronger vote leave campaign. So, I would have guessed that Portsmouth would vote leave because, despite my disparaging remarks about, it, I mean, it is an incredibly rough, rough place, but it's also, it's a naval town. It, ha- it's, it's, it's patriotic. Yeah. It's it. I it's mean, got a really good you history. you'd want Portsmouth on your side in a oh, ruck. Yeah, you, you really would. would. Yeah. The thing is, Portsmouth South is a Labour. Uh, it's a Labour seat now. So it's yeah. ne- hasn't been a Labour seat in decades, and it used to be a Lib Dem seat before the Conservatives took it. So, it's it's an interesting demographic of people. I think there's actually a lot of immigrants there, so that might sway it a little bit. Right. Um, to be sl- slightly more left wing, but no, it is. It's got a really proud history, Portsmouth, and you know you can belittle it all you want. I mean, I remember I called into LBC once with Katie Hopkins. It says Stephen from Portsmouth, and the look on her face, she just totally grimaced and sort of almost laughed, and I was, was, was sort of ready to judge me because I was from Portsmouth but I'm actually really naughty naughty Katie I know I know she <laughs> she is quite naughty sometimes she's got the she's uh, a bit like you really <laughs> yeah but I think uh, do you know what I think I'm actually nicer than Katie I mean okay. I, I'm a massive fan of hers but when we talk about me not having a filter she's got a sort of anti-filter filter it's almost <laughs> like she goes too far the other way and I just think sometimes she's a bit harsh. I mean, I think she's right on a lot of things, but yeah. I, don't think, I don't think she needs to go in quite so hard. I think she's very judgmental. Sometimes. Yes. I think that's the problem. And you, I, what, already, as a 17-year-old, it's stupid to say this, but I've learned that you shouldn't judge people by the way they look or where they're from. You should judge them on their merit, and I think she doesn't do that a lot of the time. Exactly. And people who disagree should go to the death camp of tolerance, shouldn't they? Yes. Are you a South Park fan? I'm not, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I didn't see you going there. Yeah, I got that I got that reference. Um, so um, Brexit was a glorious, a glorious dawn for our country. But now it, they're, they're trying to snap the establishment are trying to snatch it away from us, aren't they? No, I don't think so. I think, um, don't think so? there's a lot of people like Tony Blair, who are sort of old politicians who need to shut up, really, who um, like to talk about Brexit not happening. But I, I actually spoke to Nigel Farage last night again on LBC and uh, just before he went on the show and I said, do you think Brexit's going to happen? He said, yeah, of course it is. I'm really uh, um, optimistic that it will happen, but he's sort, sort of slightly more pessimistic about the substance. That's what, um, I, that's, that's what I, I meant. I, I, do you, I, do you I, mean I, sort of soft Brexit? Is that what you're talking about? Well, I, I obviously, like any sane person, I don't buy into this dichotomy of, no, of no, soft no, and hard no, Brexit. No. It's, it, Brexit. It's either, either Brexit yes, or no, yes, or, no, or no Brexit. Agree, yeah. But I suppose what I was getting at is that People with people like Philip Hammond involved in in government, we are going to get a real. Co- we're going to get a dog's a dog's Brexit. Is probably what we're going to get a dog's breakfast of a Brexit. It's going to be. It, I I worry about the caliber of the people up against people like 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 Barnier. Um, I think that David Davis, he's a kind of sly, sly, chippy, uh, aggressive um, chap. And, and and so he'll be good up to a point. But we've got too many people in this appalling government now who I just think just just low grade and, and don't really get why we why we voted for Brexit. I think what an interesting uh, idea is that these people, a lot of people in government like Theresa May and Philip Hammond, they voted Remain, they campaigned for Remain, but they've got to do, now they've got this thing that they, they'd never wanted in the first place and they've got to make it a success. And I think you've got a point in the sense that they're, they're, done, they're not total believers. So how on earth could they possibly um, want to do Brexit right? But at the same time, if you actually look at the signals of the government, leaving the single market, leaving the customs union, I think we just have to wait and see. I don't want to prejudge what the government get here because I, don't, I genuinely have no idea what's going on in David Davis's mind. And I don't know what the government's briefing papers are and I don't know what they've been preparing for the last nine months. But what we do know is that we're leaving the single market, we're leaving the customs union, we're all already getting free trade deals around the world and I'm actually really optimistic optimistic with Brexit despite the general election result and I think what we just need to do is wait and see what actually happens and then judge the government on the substance of what happens don't prejudge we're doing a Katie Hopkins we're prejudging what's going to happen we need to uh, we need to wait and see wait a few years wait until 2019 and see what the substance of Brexit is going to actually be and if not then I suppose I keep saying this um, I, in fact I, I, I mentioned this at the spectator party to David Davis that he was talking to Andrew Roberts and he didn't buy into this totally but I think if we went to war with Germany now we'd have them easy I mean they're fat they're 
th they've got about 10% of their... That's the filter, I think. They've, they've got about 10% <laughs> of their population who are not on side, basically. We know we know what they are. They're, they're going to be sort of sabotaging it, th their side. Um, I, I'm sure their Luftwaffe is barely existent. Um, and all the problems in Europe spring from Germany. So, so if push comes to shove, if we don't get what we want, I think that's the final option. The final solution. The new <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not going to go there. I am not Katie Hopkins. Um, now, um, you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, being naughty. Um, naughty with a young person. Very naughty. Yeah, very naughty. And my very special guest, Stephen Edgington, young person, 17 year old, um, uh, conservative hero already. That brings to an end this week's podcast with my very special guest. Stephen Edgington and I hope he has restored your faith in the young. We've found somebody, well two people now who actually are going to rescue the world with their sound conservative values so, that, so we're all safe. So thank you very much Stephen Edgington until next week you're listening to Dellingpole Podcast with me James Dellingpole. Thank you and goodbye.